service this evening here at the Tron. It's good to see you. Do stay behind afterwards. There'll be refreshments at the front here and also downstairs in the foyer and plenty of opportunity to meet, greet one another, encourage one another in the Lord. The psalmist says, I'll sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Well, it's Psalm 89 and we're going to begin by singing some verses of Psalm 89, number 89 in our books. And we're going to sing verses 1 and 4 and 7 and 8. 1 and 4 and 7 and 8. Forever, Lord, I'll sing your love, your faithfulness make known. With all our windows open, they'll be walking up and down the streets, very confused, wondering what's going on with the carol service. But there we are. Well, let's join together and pray. Let's pray. Gladly, Lord, we bow in your presence once again. And we rejoice to sing your praise. And we rejoice to share these words of the psalmist who knows that you are a God of faithfulness, of covenant love, of mercy. 
And yet so often it does seem that you are hiding yourself. That perhaps your wrath is burning. That we don't see the things we long to see. And we long for things that we do not see among us. We long to see the glory of Christ rejoiced in in our city and in our nation and in the world. We long to see men and women, boys and girls, coming to faith and rejoicing with us in our great King and our Savior. And yet so often our message seems to fall on that stony ground. So often it seems that people have everything else to think about by the one thing that really matters for all eternity. That is your kingdom and the glorious throne of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And yet, Lord, we thank you that your covenant is sure and certain, that your promises sealed in the blood of your own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, tell us with absolute certainty that a day is coming when at last all this world will see your glory. And when the whole world will be filled with the glory of Christ as the waters cover the sea, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have given us this great certainty, this great assurance, this great rock upon which to build our lives. And so we pray that you would come to us afresh tonight. Fill our hearts with that truth. Send us on our way into this coming week, knowing that whatever the world throws at us, whatever questionings, whatever things there may be to discourage us and disillusion us, that our hope will never be in vain and our work will never be in vain. We thank you, Lord, for the certainty of the gospel. And we thank you, Lord, for the many, many encouragements that you do give us and have given us even in recent days as we have seen right among us here men and women coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, their eyes being opened, their lives being changed, the scales falling off their minds and their hearts. And they have joined with us to worship Christ, to bow before him, to give their lives to him. Lord, may we see it more and more but whether we see it in the way that we, we long for or whether there are, there will be many days of darkness. Keep us trusting you, we pray. Keep us confessing with the psalmist that you are the God who is faithful and that your covenant is ever sure. So encourage our hearts tonight, Lord, in your word. Encourage us with one another as we minister to one another after the service. Go with us into this coming week. Give us joy in our lives and joy in our lips that as we live for the Lord Jesus, we might see his glory and might see his kingdom making advances in our world and in our own lives and experiences with those that we love and long for. Keep us praying, trusting, knowing you to be the good God who loves to hear and answer prayers. So we bring those prayers to you now in faith and trust and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a warm welcome again. If you're visiting with us, you're particularly welcome. Do stay behind afterwards and uh, we'll have plenty of time to share with one another. If you're here this morning, you'll have one of these sheets of notices. If not, they're on the tables outside. Pick one up. There are various notes in them for the coming week and uh, for the weeks uh, ahead. But uh, I'll leave you to do that in your own time. We've got David and Julie Robry back with us, and I thought we'd take the chance just to say hi to David uh, because they're coming and going, and uh, because we moved our annual meeting, we didn't have a chance to, to welcome you properly at the prayer meeting uh, last Wednesday. But uh, welcome to you all. We've seen the tribe coming back and forth. Now, just tell me, how many of you are there? Just remind me, there's uh, still I, just six of you. I think there? there is still just six of us, yes. That's a relief, because yeah. we're normally, yeah. you know, we never quite know what to normally expect. Expanding. There seems to be more of you yeah. every time you yeah. come, but um, that's a relief to us, and I'm sure to you. Good. So they've been at Queen's Park this afternoon yep. and uh, are off home to bed, and 
you have got a journey tomorrow. Tell us about that. Tell us, tell us where you're going to be for the next few weeks. Okay, next few forward. weeks, yes. I, I, I might need to look up my phone to find out where we are. Um, this week we've enjoyed uh, a week in London and then uh, at Sevens of the Word, um, recharging our batteries a bit. And uh, next week we're in Northern Ireland for a week. We, we've prioritized being around at the Tron for almost every Sunday for the two months that we're having a holiday. This is a holiday rather than exactly our home assignment, so we're, we're prioritizing seeing people. So we're in Northern Ireland seeing Julie's folks and uh, relatives and, and people over there, and then in Creef for a week of holiday, and, and then around Glasgow for a couple of weeks before Northern Ireland again, then uh, Keswick, and a few more. Uh, days around Scotland. So we'll be, we'll be here and there trying to get around all, all of the congregations because we've been multiplying, but so has the Tron <laughs> locations been multiplying while we've been away. Well, so we're going to see plenty of you. That's, that's yeah. great. We've been praying lots, David. Um, we're just aware that you've had quite a lot of frustrations and, um, and difficulties and difficult personal situations to deal with in the team and the various mm -hmm. translation works. Um, just, just remind. Just there may be some folk here who don't know what you do. Just remind us what it is that you do uh, in Nigeria, and then just give us a little update on some of those things because we've been much in prayer for that. Yeah, I, I'm a translation Bible translation consultant, so I'm helping uh, Nigerians who speak some English to understand the Bible and figure out how to use their language to communicate what the Bible is is communicating. Um, so a bit of training, a bit of research, a bit of quality control to, to help them make sure that the translation isn't just a stream of chaotic, incoherent words, but that it is really useful for um, preaching and teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. Um, so you, you, the, the, you have these different teams all yeah. over the place, because when we visited a few years ago, we went to one of them in Kagoro, yes, and there's a whole group of people working on that translation. And you come in and and help them and spend time with them. Yes, um, often sort of mentoring translators in in a couple of different teams uh, at a time. And so, for a number of years, I worked with the Guarok uh, team from Kagoro. Um, frustratingly, that seemed to sort of fall apart and. You never know, in a, in a few years' time, it might be that we can come back and pick that up. There were many frustrations with, with that. They, they made progress, but it was slow for various reasons, and they, um, uh, but you know, I, I think God will be glorified eventually. Um, one, one thing that was good that came out of that, I, I learned a lot from working with that team, um, so that I can pour in what I've I've learned out of working with that team for, for other teams. There's an, the Ashe team, some of you might have heard of, um, are a little bit further down the road, about three hours drive away from Joss, where we live. And I've been working with them quite closely for the last two years. Um, we got through a first check of Luke's Gospel, um, and we finally got up to three translators on the team. It's quite hard finding the right kind of people to join the translation team, but then one of the uh, translators had to leave the team because he just, his lifestyle wasn't, and the way he, his teamwork didn't match up with the gospel, so that was very sad that the, the committee had to let him go because we'd invested quite a lot of effort mm -hmm. into him. But in the meantime, I, I've also developed relationships with uh, theological College in Kagoro, which is where the Guarok language was based. And I've been meeting for, I guess, a couple of years now, um, teaching some of the pastors about Bible translation. Um, because often they're educated in English, and there may be a vague idea that they would translate what they study into their local situations. But actually, that just doesn't happen. They, they just speak English, no one understands, and everyone's fine with that. Um, and so I was challenging them to sort of think a bit more about that. Going through the motions of Christianity, all in an incoherent language, 
maybe isn't building the church up very solidly. Uh, so that's been very good. I've been learning a lot from the student pastors, which has helped, I think, in, in my work with training translators to make useful translations. Okay. So um, anything very particular you'd like us to be praying for just now while you're away yeah. from, that, from that work? I think if you pray, pray for us as a family that we'd have a good rest, especially for Julie, who is quite intense for Julie because I get to go out to work um, in different places, but she is at home with the girls, homeschooling them, and uh, sometimes, yeah, that, that's, that's tricky sometimes. It's delightful other times, but not always. Um, uh, and maybe if you could pray for my colleagues, uh, Arams and Moses, um, especially for well, this month they're farming, next month they should be getting back into their work, um, really doing some crucial research in the language so that they can try and make the translation coherent. And they'll be doing this without me uh, and my colleague Kathleen on hand to help them. So this could be a quite a crucial test to see whether they can work well together uh, independently and to see how much they've actually picked up from the last six months of, of work together. Uh, it was just one thing, wasn't it? But just maybe one other thing. Uh, could you pray for us as, as our our t wider team in Nigeria, the Wycliffe team in, in Nigeria. We've got to work out really how we, how we approach our mission, how we fund it, um, uh, and whether we let money drive things a bit too much um, and our priorities. Would you pray that we would be able to help our colleagues to see that we shouldn't just be doing gospel work in whatever way balances the books, but gospel work in a way which is shaped by the gospel and gospel characteristics. We were encouraged along that way uh, this week at, at Servants of the Word um, by Simon Manchester. So pray, pray for our, our wider colleagues in Nigeria. Okay, um, we'll do that. We'll do that a little later on. Thanks, David. Well, we'll hear more from you uh, at the prayer meeting next month. It's great to see you all. Great to have you back with us. And it's so good that you're here nearly every weekend as well. We're going to sing again, and uh, then I'm going to hand over to Josh to read the scriptures. This time, I think it's on the screens. By faith, we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design.
Good evening. We're going to turn to our Bible reading now. And we're finishing off the little prophet of Haggai this evening. So please turn that up in your Bibles. It's the third last book of the Old Testament, uh, just before Zechariah. And we're going to read uh, the last four verses, Haggai chapter 2, reading from verses 20 to 23. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdom of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Amen. This is God's word. We now turn to sing a hymn that speaks of the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy. And indeed of what was promised to King David. We sing hymn number 484. Heal to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son.
quiet, uh, we might like to read again this passage that we're studying together or refresh ourselves on uh, the rest of Haggai. And whilst that happens, the offering is going to be lifted. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, who has given us everything that we have, we praise you again this evening. And Lord, as we give these gifts to you for the work of your gospel, we do pray for its work all around the world. As we've been hearing from the Rubries, we do pray for them this evening. We thank you that they can have this time of holiday and rest. And we do pray that it would be that, that as they catch up with family and friends and with us here as their church family, that they would find that refreshing uh, for the work that they do. And that as they return and engage again in that vital work of seeing your word made available in ways that can be read and understood all the way uh, across the lands to Nigeria, we do um, We do pray for them. We know that there's nothing more precious in this world than uh, your word. Indeed, it is the greatest thing that this world affords. And so we pray for your sustaining grace for David and Julie and the family and the team uh, that they work with. To the world, it would seem like a fool's errand to move to a far-flung place, away from careers, away from all that you know. But Lord, we know that it's not a waste. And so we pray that their labors would serve the church for generations to come in Nigeria and even beyond. Lord, we know that there'll be difficulties all throughout this and perhaps it will seem at times to them futile. The slow progress, the opposition, the difficulties. But Lord, we pray that they would be encouraged always by the future that you've promised. That they would be encouraged to know that nothing done for you is in vain. And that all that is done in service of you, all that is done for the growth of your kingdom, is an an investment in the wonderful climax of history that you will achieve. Lord, we thank and praise you that you will accomplish all your grand purposes. And that as we play our part, as we build that which will last through your help, 
that that is building towards a wonderful future where all things, all wrongs will be made right. And Lord, we pray too for all those who are at the conference this past week, that they would return to their ministries across Scotland and Bolden for the task of being servants of your word, that with great certainty and clarity on uh, what uh, the coming judgment brings, of what the coming glory of the Lord Jesus brings, that they would also have an urgency in the work that they're doing to see more people come into the wonderful kingdom that belongs to your son. Lord, we pray that you would work in us this evening, that we too would have a clear vision of all that you have been doing in world history and all that you will do, that we would be confident to press on in serving you because we know that at the last day, Jesus will sit on the throne and reign justly and righteously forever. And when that day comes, you will lavish upon your people all blessings, that they will have everything. So work on us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we turn to God's words, uh, we sing the hymn on the screens. And let's make that our prayer this evening, not just for ourselves, but for those around us. Let's sing, speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Do turn again uh, in your Bibles to Haggai chapter 2. 
When I look at a beaten up piece of property, I can only see how terrible it looks. I don't have the vision to see what it once was, or more importantly, what it could become. Now, I do love seeing a property that has been transformed from a shell that's needed serious attention through to a beautiful restored building. But some people can walk into a building and think instantly about what they would do to improve it. They've got a vision of what they would want it to look like. They can see through all the work that needs to be done, all the mess that there is, all the wallpaper that needs to be scraped, the disheveled ceiling that needs to be fixed, what walls ought to come down, all the rest. And they know how to turn what is drab and dreary into something delightful. They have a vision for what can come of it. Whereas others like me will walk in and be dispirited by the state of things and we, uh, the potential of it's lost on us. Without the vision of where it's heading, the work seems too much. And that's what we need at points. We need to have our vision extended beyond the immediate to see what is going to happen, what, what the future is going to look like. And that's how Haggai comes to a close. The word of the Lord speaks again and the restoration community are given a grand vision of what lay ahead potentially in the immediate future, but certainly in the ultimate future. Before we look at the two parts to that grand vision, let's just remember the setting that Israel found themselves in as this restoration community. Israel's glorious past, where God's kingdom was obvious and flourishing, when they were under David and then Solomon, the days of the great temple, the great prosperity in the promised land, that had all fallen apart. The land divided between a northern kingdom under Jeroboam and a southern kingdom under Rehoboam. And from there, it only spiraled even more as eventually both kingdoms are taken into exile and there's no king in Israel. The temple was destroyed, the people captured, and it was a disaster. The kingdom of God on earth looked like it was finished. What about all those great covenant promises? Had Israel's rebellion, their constant refusal to listen to God, had that voided God's covenant promises. It certainly seemed that way until the restoration community had this opportunity to rebuild thanks to Cyrus and Darius. There was hope once again that God's kingdom might be established, even if that hope was just flickering. For Israel to be truly restored, there were great obstacles. We've seen that the temple being rebuilt was one of those, but there were other obstacles too. There was They were under the rule of the Persians. They were not their own nation. And there was no king, only a governor. And so the people needed to have a vision of what the restoration was achieving because to them it looked pretty average, pretty disappointing. They need to see what they're building for and building towards, just like the person who sees clearly the potential of a property The vision of the end is what aligns each step of the process. The vision of what it will look like is what keeps you going as the project is undertaken. And we too need to know that our hope and that our labors to spread the gospel are not in vain. And so the vision that Haggai gives the people of God, both in his own day and to us, is firstly, verses 20 to 22, the enemies of God defeated the enemies of God defeated. And then secondly, in verse 23, the enthronement of the greater David. So first, verses 20 to 22, the enemies of God defeated. There can only be and will only be one winner at the climax of history. It will be God and with him his people. All the great acts of God rescuing his people in history are pictures of of what God will ultimately do in overthrowing this world. Israel were still subjugated to a foreign power, and so this was a necessary hope for them. When the world seems to be against God's kingdom, we can often think, will it continue? Never mind flourish. And that's the hope that we need to to live as aliens and strangers in this world that's determined to dismantle anything in our society that has God at its center. And so verse 20, 
the word of the Lord came again to his people through Haggai. And that comes on the same day as the prophecy we looked at last week. The great culmination of that prophecy in verses 10 to 19 is that God is waiting to bless his people. He spelt out to them how things were when they went their own way and ignored him. It was curses. But from the very day that they nailed their colors to the mast, from the day that they turned to God's way and listened to him, from the very day that they heard and responded to God's word, verse 19, I will bless you from that day on. And that was imminently about the harvest that they were anticipating. But now we see that that blessing, will, what that blessing will mean in the fullness of time, it will look like verse 21. God shaking the heavens and the earth. God is going to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. He's going to destroy the strength of kingdoms. Overthrow the chariots and the riders. The horses and the riders shall go down. Everyone by the sword of his brother. We've already seen that God will shake the world at the start of chapter 2 as he plans to elevate the latter glory of the temple. But the shaking is more than that. I once heard a preacher describing where he came from and explaining that it wasn't a particularly nice part of the country. I shan't say where that is. But he said that there was once a small earthquake and because of the state of where he was from, the earthquake actually improved it. That is tongue-in-cheek, of course. But when we think of tremors and great shaking, we think of its destructive and chaotic aftermath. Of course it didn't improve his town or city. But what we read here is that God is going to shake the world and bring not disorder, but order. That's what the shaking in verses 6 and 7 was ultimately going to do. And with all the other descriptions here, it is again what will happen. God shaking the earth will be to establish his unshakable kingdom. The shaking will get rid of all that is corrupt, all that is wrong, all that is in opposition to God and his people. And the rest of the language that we see in these two verses is used deliberately to hark back to historic triumphs that God has brought. There's a recap of God's previous triumphs for his people throughout the Old Testament. Look at verse 22. The use of the word overthrowing, this harkens back to Sodom, a city that was set on wickedness, that was in complete and absolute opposition to God and his ways, and one in which they couldn't even find 10 righteous men. So God overthrew the city. He defeated those who were enemies to him and his people. So too will God ultimately overthrow the throne of all kingdoms that oppose him and his people. Verse 22 again, he says, I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdom of nations. The words used by God to Israel in Deuteronomy when he was promising to give the land to his people, he said, God would give them over and throw them into confusion until they were destroyed. No one will be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you. Just as God was the conqueror of the promised land, just as he promised to destroy his and his people's enemies, so he did. As they began the conquest, he appeared as their commander and ensured victory over the Canaanites. He promised this and he delivered it, even though the Canaanites had great chariots of iron, even though they looked mighty. And God says, I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. But it wasn't just the Canaanites who faced this. You might recognize the phrase, the horses and the riders will go down. Just like the massive army of Pharaoh that was sent down into the depths of the sea so that Israel could sing this song. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. The Lord is a man of war, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he has cast into the sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew. And finally, the last phrase in verse 22. Everyone will face this by the sword of his brother. Just like when Gideon in the day of the judges oversaw victory over Midian, Comrades turned upon each other with their own swords. 
The same thing happened with Saul and the Philistines. What Haggai is telling us here is that God has a history, a rich history, and it is a history of defeating his enemies and bringing victory for his people. It's a history of bringing victory for his kingdom. And what Haggai is saying is that all of these past victories are shadows of the great overturning, the great shaking, the great establishing of God's unshakable kingdom. That is what God is going to do. And now as the remnant faced up to the reduced status of Israel in this restoration, as they lived life at the whim of a global superpower, this was a necessary reminder that God holds all nations in his hand. God holds all nations in his hand. Even when God's people are put under the most intense or severe persecution, that will not change the outcome of history. Just as the reduced and meager circumstances of Israel here didn't void God's purposes. Israel might have asked, will we live forever as subjects of this foreign power? Well, this is God's emphatic answer. Now there are glimpses, uh, now they've already seen glimpses that God has been working to this end already. There's been minor shaking, we could call it. The Babylonians have been replaced by the Persians, and that's what's allowed them to return to the land at all. But this is a much grander promise than just their immediate situation. God holds the fate of nations in his hands, and ultimately all who oppose him All who stand in the way of his kingdom progressing, all who stand in the way of his people are his enemies. And the day is coming where God will finally shake the world and overthrow those enemies. We might look around and despair at the world around us, a world that revels in abortion to the point there's wild celebrations when it's legalized. We might look around and see that our society wants to unman man in any way possible, and so with it, de-God God. We might look further afield and see the growing physical hostility that our gospel partners around the world face, like in Delhi. We might see others who have to go to church with armed guards in Pakistan. We might look around and see that Christianity in the West is in serious decline. I was talking to someone just this week at the conference who told me that a change in legislation in the country they were working in meant that their church was reduced by two-thirds because persecution was now a real possibility. In the face of all this, what hope do a small number of gospel churches in Scotland really have of keeping going, never mind expanding and building? What hope do we have as No doubt legislation will come soon that makes life more difficult for us as Christians. Maybe down the line it might even make it excruciatingly hard. Well, any power, any government, any group or person that sits in opposition to God and sits in opposition to his people will ultimately come to nothing. We aren't the people who need to fear. The world is. The testimony of all that God has done in the past in faithfulness to his promises and faithfulness to his people is drawn together here in Haggai and harnessed as proof, as evidence of the coming fruition of the greater salvation that is to come, of the final defeat of all that is evil. This is not just ancient history for Israel or for us. It is the model through which we can see a bright future All those ancient victories that Haggai cites here are a model through which we can see what will happen in a grander, bigger, better way. Wickedness, evil, corruption, all that is wrong will come to a very drastic end. God wins in the end. No matter how unlikely that looks now, the might of Pharaoh was put down, the chariots of Canaan were crushed, none of those stand a chance. He will stand in victory over all his enemies. He will eradicate all evil. He will overthrow all that opposes him. And as he does this, his people will be with him, sharing in all that it means. 
He lavishes grace upon his people so that they will have rescue and resurrection and rest. We might feel like we're clinging on, like we're dying out, like we're going to be overcome. But our future is as sure as the exodus and the conquest and all the other great saving acts of history. As real as they are, so is this wonderful future when the Lord returns. And just as the enemies of God are defeated, so too will there be the enthronement of the greater David. Verse 23, the enthronement of the greater David. Israel might have wondered if the covenant with David had been trampled underfoot. That was the cry of the psalm we began singing this evening. How long, O Lord, is it forever that you have turned away? Israel is now but a little backwater. There's no throne. Where is the king of Israel? All he had now as a descendant of David was a puppet governor. But God assures his people that the greatest David will rule the world ultimately forever. God's covenant with David still stands. Of course it does. Look at verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. Now, Israel might have good reason to question the restoration in the place of the king. After all, back in Jeremiah, it looked like the descendants of David would be cast off forever. Coniah, king of Judah, was called a signet ring on God's right hand. And God said that he would tear the ring off and give Coniah into the hands of the Babylonians. And it was through the, Babylon, through the Babylonians that the line of David was cut off from the throne that had happened. There was no king. There was no descendant of David on the throne. But now, God says that this has been reversed. God reaffirms his commitment to his covenant with David through his descendant, through Zerubbabel. Look at how Zerubbabel is addressed in verse 23. Oh, Zerubbabel, my servant. That's a title that was used regularly of David. And God is making clear that he is again setting up David's line. It is no surprise that the restoration of David's line is linked to the temple. When the covenant with David was made, it was as David declared his intention to make a temple for God, that God promised that his line would reign forever. Zerubbabel is proof that the line of David stands. As sure as Zerubbabel is in the midst of Israel, so sure would there be a king that reigns forever from David's line. That's what God's promising here. And turn over to Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy that leads through to the birth of Jesus. Look at verse 12 and 13. There is Zerubbabel, smack bang in the middle of the family line of Jesus. There's the Zerubbabel smack bang in the line of the greater, the ultimate king in David's line, the Lord Jesus himself. Israel could be assured that through Zerubbabel, God's covenant stood. They were not aimlessly going about their work. God was still very much in it. God was still very much committed to his kingdom. Zerubbabel was another significant cog in the history of salvation that leads all the way through to Jesus. God's choosing of Zerubbabel in this way is not a mere token thing. It wasn't simply to fix eyes to the ultimate future, although it certainly does that. But it was another reassurance of God's commitment to the people there and then that what they were doing was paving the way. The signet ring was a seal of God's authority, of God's presence with his anointed, It was the thing that would authenticate the true king of the true people of God. And here, in this day of small things, when the situation looked bleak, Zerubbabel was faithful in doing what God asked. He led the people in repentance, chapter 1. He has overseen the foundation being laid as they rebuild the temple. And that obedience was not wasted, even when it looked like nothing was going to happen. Because God is committed to his work. 
And this passage assures Israel that the work of the kingdom is always of eternal significance, no matter what external circumstances look like. Zerubbabel and his present faithfulness was playing his part in the unfolding story of the gospel. And as Israel responded to God's word, he reminds them and reassures them that their faith is looking forward to the day of the final gospel declaration the declaration of God's final victory in battle. Satan and all the powers and principalities of this world will be overthrown. And they'll be overthrown by the one who was ultimately spoken of in the covenant with David. The Lord said to David, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And Jesus is the king who is going to reign forever. So how much more can we be sure of what awaits? How much more can we be sure that God is in the work that we have to do, that God is committed to his kingdom? The shaking has begun. The earth was shaken at his death through an earthquake. It was shaken at his resurrection as a stone was rolled away. But when he returns to claim his final victory, that is when the great shaking of kingdoms and thrones will take place and nothing will stop him. No liberal ideology, no atheistic manifesto, no rival religious state, no government, no king, no dictator, no alliance of nations will stand in the way of Jesus claiming a victory that we can share in. Jesus has been raised up to sit in the place of highest honor. He is the great king the fulfillment of all that the prophets spoke of. And not only is he now the true temple, but he's the true king. At the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, he was given such a title. He was given a crown. He was bowed down to. He was clothed in purple robes in a palace before taking to his earthly throne. But that was all in mockery. His title was King of the Jews as they mocked. It was a crown of thorns and his earthly throne was a cross. But Jesus is coming back as the true king and it won't be in the humble state of as Zerubbabel or even as his first coming. He is coming back in glory and the whole world will know it. There will be no mockery at that point and no appearance of weakness only victory. It will be the denouement, the zenith, the climax of all of world history and all that God has promised to do. Jesus will sit on the forever throne that was promised to David, and in so doing, he will turn the oppression that his people know. He will turn the feelings we have when we're marginalized, mocked, opposed. He will turn them all upside down, ending them forever. The Israelites of Haggai's day had the task of rebuilding a temple that was going to be a shadow of what had gone before, struggling to believe that what they were doing mattered because there was no king. Perhaps that's how we feel about life now as a church, as we seek to reach Scotland with the gospel or even just the street we live on. The world overwhelms. The struggle to get through another week seems too much. Well, Haggai has given us a vision of what we're building towards. And the work of the kingdom is always of eternal significance, no matter what external circumstances look like. For Zerubbabel, it was through clearing rubble. It was through getting bricks ready to lay that he was told that he would be the person through whom the royal line of David would be restored. It was through faithfulness with rubble that God turned his people's eyes to see the final picture. Maybe when you think of serving the church, you see it like I see a dilapidated building. When you think of what you do to share the gospel, it just seems like it has little potential. How can it ever make a lasting difference in this world that's so against us? Perhaps you think that the size of the task is too big and our tools are too limited. Well, God gives us here a glimpse at the final masterpiece of what he will do. 
what he will do in the end. And so he invites us to take part, assured that it will happen, and that any obstacles, any opposition will be dealt with. The small, and at times we might even think puny work that we do now, in faithfully serving the Lord will be proven to be cosmically significant in the end. Every hour lovingly devoted, every person invested in, every conversation conducted that carries the aroma of Christ, every book bought and given away, every child taught, every painfully slow translation of a verse of the Bible attempted, every pound sacrificially given, every ministry prayed for, every act of service for brothers and sisters, every lift offered, every welcome lavished are all investing in this future which can't be touched, which can't be spoilt, which can't be done away with. And all of these things display our faith in what God is going to achieve. God gives us a vision of his masterpiece so that we can be assured that all that is done for him will not be shaken away, but looks ahead to his coming. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the magnificent grace that you've displayed through these verses and all that you've promised. That at the last day, on that day, you will achieve victory for all those who belong to you. That will share in all that Jesus has done and all that Jesus has won. So encourage us with this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we close by singing of this wonderful future. Number 971, Jerusalem the Golden.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.